Good evening, and welcome to the Smithsonian National Museum of African Arts exhibition celebration of Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, Art, Culture, and Exchange Across Medieval Saharan Africa, a project that has been more than 10 years in the making by our organizing partners at the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University. Tonight, you will see for the first time the Smithsonian's presentation of this extraordinary exhibition in our galleries in Washington, DC. You will also hear from some special guests and have an opportunity later this evening for a live Q&A session with select experts and to join a listening lounge that features music from this wonderfully diverse region on the African continent. Before we get started, I want to thank you all for joining us from wherever you are in the world. It's a privilege to serve as interim director of this museum and to experience firsthand the ways in which this dynamic team fulfills our mission. As the only museum in the United States that collects African art in all art forms from antiquity to the today, we are honored to share this special program with you tonight. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the 14th secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Lonnie Bunch. Thank you, Deborah. Friends, advisory board members, foreign dignitaries, hello. I'm pleased to welcome you to this tremendously important event. I wish we all could be gathered at the museum to see this wonderful exhibition, but I'm happy you'll be able to see a virtual tour of it. When I found out Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time was coming to the Nash Museum of African, African Art, I was excited since I was so impressed when I saw the exhibition at the Block Museum in Evanston. I was struck by its ability to centralize Africa, showing the profound ways the West African gold trade connected the world and transformed it forever. The team at the National Museum of African Art have done a wonderful job taking the exhibition, shaping it in their own image, and producing a beautiful, thought-provoking adaptation. These 300-plus works spanning a Saharan region of West Africa, breathe life into the complex story and material culture of medieval Africa. It's a time and place too seldom discussed and too little understand in the United States. Due to the coronavirus, the exhibition didn't open in April as planned. So the talented folks at the museum used their creativity and made an engaging online version that people can access anywhere, thanks to technology. Expanding cultural and historical understanding is central to the National Museum of African Art and to the Smithsonian. While there is no substitute for the real objects, Caravans of Gold is a terrific illustration of how technology can achieve that goal by bringing a robust content to a wider audience. I look forward to the day African art can reopen so visitors can see this remarkable exhibition in person. In the meantime, I thank you for your interest. I thank you for support. And I thank you for taking time to spend with us to celebrate this important exhibition. Please enjoy the rest of the evening. Enjoy the tour. And thank you once again for your support. Thank you, Lonnie. As Lonnie mentioned, this exhibition shares an important history with us all about Africa's central role in a globalized world. To share more about her vision for Caravans of Gold Fragments in Time, please join me in welcoming Kathleen Bigford Berzak, the Associate Director for Curatorial Affairs at the Block Museum of Art and organizing curator for this extraordinary project. Hello. It's an honor to have the exhibition Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time presented at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. I warmly thank colleagues there who've made this moment possible. As the exhibition's curator, I feel the privilege of speaking on behalf of the many collaborators who so open-heartedly contributed their time, knowledge, counsel, and encouragement to this project over eight years of work. I'm especially grateful to colleagues at the institutions in Mali, Morocco, and Nigeria who've been unflagging in their support of the exhibition, 
have worked tirelessly to make loans available for display and extended those loans with such generosity when it became clear that the COVID-19 pandemic would delay the exhibition's opening in Washington, D.C. Caravans of Gold presents a medieval world that looks outward from the Sahara, offering a corrective to perceptions of the period that disregard West Africa's active connections to far-reaching networks of exchange. The exhibition takes as its starting point medieval West Africa's sparse and scattered material record by focusing on three major sites, Sigil Massa in Morocco and Gawan Tadmecca in Mali. The rare fragments that emerge from these sites and others like them make the past tangible. They're time travelers that are simultaneously of the past and in the present, and they evoke what's been called the archeological imagination our ability to imagine the past through its remains. Take, for instance, this small fragment of light green porcelain, no bigger than the nail of my index finger. Its distinctive characteristics identify it as a kind of porcelain called Qingbeiware that was produced in China between the 10th and the 14th centuries and widely exported. The fragment was excavated at the site of Tadmecca, a town that thrived in the same period on the fringes of the Sahara, in what's today central Mali. The shard is exhibited beside a complete Qingbei porcelain bowl, representing the kind of object that the fragment was once a part of. In the exhibition, juxtapositions like this invite us to understand and see the past in our mind's eye in new ways. The exhibition also creates surprising juxtapositions between extraordinary works of art some of which are more familiar to museum go goers and which have never been exhibited together before. This 12th century gold bead from Egypt, the 14th century copper alloy seated figure from central Nigeria, the 14th century ivory virgin and child from France are all connected through the precious materials from which they're made, each of which was exchanged across Saharan routes. In her 2009 TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story, the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie describes the importance of telling many stories about people and places. She relates how reducing a person's or a culture's story to a single narrative robs people of dignity. Caravans of Gold attends to this call to reform how Africa's history is recounted. Fragments of many kinds have been brought together to tell this story of medieval Africa. In addition to the material fragments that lie at the heart of the archaeological endeavor, there are also textual fragments from Arabic accounts that require another type of excavation to discover and interpret. There are fragments of forms, practices, and techniques that have been passed along through time and that with care can provide some insight into the past across that distance. And there's the work of specialists today, each invested in a topic that provides a viewpoint into a larger picture. This project has brought together individuals working in many fields and professions. I can't thank them all by name here, but I want to name in particular Abdallah Fili, Mamadou Cisse, Mamadi Dembele, Sarah Guerin, Esmeralda Calais, Ali Kotach, Ron Messier, Sam Nixon, Christina Normor, and Ray Silverman. They were each essential to the project from beginning to end. In the exhibition, several of these dedicated individuals are featured in short videos that tell critical stories in their own voices. In the days before Caravans of Gold opened at Northwestern University's Block Museum, we convened a group of museum professionals and archeologists who work in Mali, Morocco, and Nigeria to discuss how we could share this story even more widely. We agreed that an app that could be accessed in Arabic, French, and English would be an ideal extension of the project that would transcend barriers of distance, language, and resources. Working with a group of Northwestern undergraduate students, we created the Caravans of Gold app, which launched this past summer. The Moroccan archeologist Abdallah Fili has called Caravans of Gold an homage to archaeology. My hope is that new fragments in time will continue to be added to this story so that our vision of Africa's medieval past will continue to grow.
Thank you, Kathleen, for joining us this evening and for taking us behind the scenes of this extraordinary project. Now, let's take a glimpse of the exhibition with one of the National Museum of African Arts curators and tonight's tour guide, Kevin Dumouchel. Welcome to Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, Art, Culture, and Its Change Across Medieval Saharan Africa. My name is Kevin Dumouchel, I'm the curator here at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African Art. It has been my distinct honor and pleasure to curate our presentation of this groundbreaking exhibition. Developed over a decade by our partner institution, the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University, Caravans is also the product of years of collaboration with museum partners on the African continent in Morocco, Mali, and Nigeria. In this way, Caravans not only allows us to explore and reimagine the African past, it also models new parameters for how we continue to tell these stories into the future. The first exhibition to focus on global medieval Saharan Africa, Caravans features over 300 works of art from the 8th to the 16th century of the Taman era, from across the Saharan region of West Africa, as well as its diverse peripheries and sites of exchange. From England and Italy, to Iran and China, as well as Nigeria and Ghana. This exhibition is a landmark opportunity to reconsider our understanding of world history. Gold from West Africa was an engine that drove the movement of people, things, and ideas across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East in an interconnected medieval world. As the incredible works in this exhibition show, it is impossible to understand the emergence of the early modern world without this West African story. Africa's history is truly a world history. Caravans of Gold calls on what archeologists have termed the archeological imagination, the act of recapturing the past through surviving traces to present a critical reimagining of the medieval period. Here, rare and precious archeological fragments are seen side by side complete artworks. The exhibition responds to pressing questions of our time. How can museums make sense of a material legacy that exists only in fragments? What role does imagination play in resurrecting the past? In our story, medieval Africa begins with the spread of Islam in the 8th century of the Taman era and recedes with the arrival of Europeans along the continent's Atlantic coast at the end of the 15th century. The reach of Trans-Saharan exchange is revealed in the fragments excavated from archaeological sites now uninhabited, that were once vibrant communities. In this exhibition, these fragments in time are placed alongside works of art and other materials that allow us to imagine them as they once were. They are the starting point for reimagining the medieval past and for seeing the present in a new light. As you've already heard, this exhibition would not be possible without the support of international partners from Nigeria, from Mali, and Morocco. To deliver a special message, please join me in welcoming Her Highness Princess Lala Jumala, the ambassador of the Kingdom of Morocco to the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to join you today to celebrate virtually the exhibition Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, Retracing Art, Culture and Exchange Across Medieval Saharan Africa. I am particularly honored to represent the Kingdom of Morocco in this event, marking the arrival to Washington, D.C of such a meaningful and prestigious exhibition. For those of you familiar with my country and its history, Morocco's participation in this exhibition should come as no surprise and is justified at many levels. First and foremost, it is a reflection of the firm commitment of His Majesty, King Mohammed VI, to fully integrating art and culture within the holistic human development model at the heart of His Majesty's vision 
for a progressive and open Moroccan society. It is also in keeping with Morocco's attachment to its deeply rooted history with the African continent through spiritual, cultural, political and economic ties that span back centuries and remain stronger than ever today. Indeed, Morocco's African vocation is one that His Majesty upholds proudly and that can be felt across all walks of life in Morocco. The strong influence of our African heritage is enshrined in the Moroccan constitution and one can see it, touch it, feel it and taste it in many aspects of everyday life, from art to music, food, language and beyond. Africa is truly part and parcel of Morocco's identity and this is most evident in the shared history that binds us going as far back as the medieval times explored through this exhibition. As you discover the Caravans of Gold exhibition, you will, I understand the unique role Morocco plays in this Pan-African global and cosmopolitan story centered in the Sahel-Saharan region. You will also better comprehend the historic nature of Morocco's Saharan identity and why it is so intrinsically linked to my country's present and future. This wonderful project would not have been possible without the partnership and support of the various Moroccan institutions who generously lent artworks, including the Moroccan Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports, Bank al Maghrib, the National Foundation of Museums, the Archaeological Museums of Rabat, and the Department of History and Islamic Archaeology at the University Shuhaib Dukali of Al Jadida. I would also like to sincerely congratulate the organizers, the Block Museum at Northwestern University and the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art for bringing such a fascinating exhibition to North American audiences. We appreciate the growing partnership between Morocco and the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art and look forward to many more similar projects together. As I leave you to enjoy the Caravans of Gold exhibition, I am confident that it will not only be a thought-provoking experience, but also one which may undo many stereotypes. For us Africans, it is one we strongly encourage you to explore as a reminder that our continent has always been a land of openness, opportunity, knowledge and exchange. This precious legacy is one we are proud to perpetuate as we seek a common destiny of progress for what will always be our greatest wealth, our people. Thank you. Shukran. The show opens by situating us in a distinctive geographic place, the Sahara, through a display of relatively contemporary works from the region. More recent material and cultural practices, after all, can sometimes provide insights into imagining the past. Like their predecessors, artists in today's Sahara are connected to a global economy, and their works often reflect these evolving patterns. Yet, the forms functions and decorative patterns on even recent Saharan jewelry, leatherwork, and textiles are sometimes reflective of earlier medieval precedents. As you cross the threshold into the main gallery, a large-scale reproduction of the famed Catalan Atlas indicates that we've now stepped back seven centuries in time to the cosmopolitan heart of the medieval Sahara. As you enter, you are met by the two equally precious commodities that drive the entire story to follow salt, and gold. 
a dazzling display of gold dinars, a currency introduced in the early Islamic empires that circulated for large-scale purchases, join us courtesy of the Banco Maghrib in Morocco. Many of these dinars were struck at the site of Sigil Massa, a crucial trading entrepot on the edge of the Sahara whose wealth helped states like the Almoravid and Almohad caliphates extend their influence from Spain to the edges of the Niger River and beyond. Gold and salt were at the heart of a global medieval economy that bound Africa with the Mediterranean world. Artists from Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, Morocco, and Italy, to peripheries as far-flung and exotic as England, shared a visual culture of gold. Gold leaf was an appropriate material for European artists depicting religious subjects and panel paintings, as the color was often associated with divinity. The light reflecting properties of gold brought an image on an altarpiece to life in the flickering candlelight of a church, allowing for the illusion of heaven on earth. The next time you cook with salt or handle a book binding with gold leaf, you'll have a better appreciation of the journey these precious commodities have traveled. From 700 years ago until today, they're still with us. As you've just seen, this exhibition features exquisite objects on loan from many museum partners in West Africa. Joining us from Abuja, please welcome Dr. Abba Isa Tijani, Director General of the National Commission of Museums and Monuments, Nigeria. Professor Abba Isa Tijani, I'm the Director General of the National Commission for Museums and Monuments in Nigeria. We are the commission in charge of looking the artifacts and monuments uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and this exhibition, Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, Art, Culture and Exchange Across Medieval Saharan Africa, is an exhibition which we are also collaborating. Uh, and this exhibition is on the archaeological fragments that showcase the history and culture of uh, particularly of Africa in the Trans-Saharan trade route. And uh, these fragments uh, which are being exhibited uh, actually uh, looks at the history and the exchange uh, that was going on across the Trans-Saharan route and particularly with uh, other continents of the world, especially uh, Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia. I recommend uh, this exhibition for people who are interested in history and culture of the area of the continent and the contacts between these different uh, continents. Uh, the Smithsonian uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, is a, a, a good uh, partner in collaboration, which has uh, we have partnered before, uh, particularly in the uh, exhibition of uh, photographs by Alonge on the Benin Kingdom, one of the photographs he took to, uh, of the monarchs of Benin which were exhibited uh, in Europe, but also eventually came back home to Benin. And uh, that exhibition was homecoming, and uh, it actually showcased the history of that Benin kingdom and uh, the, the, the court uh, tradition in Benin. And uh, this is a, it was a very successful ex uh, partner with the Smithsonian African Museum. And we look forward to more partnership uh, in similar areas and also with other interested uh, institutions that promote about our culture and art. And uh, this is an era where we need to collaborate. And uh, we have a lot of uh, areas to partner. So we look forward to this kind of uh, partnership as we are doing with the Smithsonian uh, African Museum. Uh, so I wish you all the best and uh, particularly greetings from the Commission here in Nigeria. Thank you very much.
The first gallery of caravans focuses on the trade in luxury goods and the way in which this trade connected peripheries on either side of the Sahara, from the glories of the forest kingdoms of what is now Nigeria to remote and far-flung provinces like Italy and England. Indeed, even kingdoms at the farthest reaches of the Niger River, near its expansive delta in what is now southern Nigeria, were connected to a global medieval economy. The glorious masterworks of renowned West African forest civilizations, like those at Ibukwu and Ife, demonstrate connections between forest, river, desert, and beyond. Archaeological excavations at West African sites associated with the Ife kingdom, as well as with the earlier polity of Ibukwu, reveal the prominence of red gold, or copper, as well as glass beads and ivory among the materials that circulated through the Sahara Desert in multiple directions. Tracing their movement provides a fascinating image of the wide scope of medieval trade. Excavations conducted at Ibukwu unearthed a remarkable group of over 600 prestige objects, including extraordinary cast copper alloy sculptures and more than 165,000 glass and carnelian beads. Evidence ties wealthy and powerful Ibukwu to global medieval trade networks that extended down the Niger River from the edge of the Sahara Desert. Glass beads provide a telling link. The same types that have been found at Ibukwu and, and at Gao in Mali in the western Sudan. One of a number of true gems from museums in Nigeria, this vessel, excavated from a storeroom for ritual objects at Ibukwu and known as the Roped Pot, is a masterpiece of lost wax casting. It was made using a rare technique called burning in, in which separately cast parts are fused together in subsequent firings to achieve a complex form. This unique casting process was certainly developed independently at this site. Ife, in turn, was the political and ritual center of a kingdom that supported a multi-ethnic regional economy. Its reach extended to the Niger River, nearly 120 miles to its north, paving the way for its participation in global networks of exchange. Finds at the village of Tada, on the banks of the Niger, and on nearby Jeba Island, suggest that these were strategic outposts for Ife, linking the kingdom to north-south and east-west trade routes. This figure of a man wearing woven or quilted armor and carrying a quiver on his back was found on Jeba Island in the Niger River. The figure also wears a large medallion, necklaces, armlets, and anklets, along with cowrie shells. Now, cowries from the Indian Ocean were used as currency in parts of medieval West Africa. They might have been transported overland to central Nigeria along east-west routes, or across the Sahara and down the Niger River. The style and the extraordinarily thin casting of this naturalistic seated figure, a true masterpiece of world art, points to its likely creation at Ife. In the early 20th century, the figure was part of the ritual life of Tada, a small village on the bank of the Niger River, 120 miles north of Ife where it was regularly bathed by local caretakers in the river. During the medieval period, Tada's location would have been of strategic importance to Ife, connecting it with long-distance trade. Analysis of the raw copper from which the statue is made suggests that some of the source metal might have originated in France, traveling along these very trade routes to Ife, where it was cast. As copper and other trade goods from Europe made their way south, the large and precious tusks of the African savanna elephant in turn found their way north, where ivory artisans carved this African material into the heart of European medieval religious imagery and ritual practice. It's amazing to think about Africa and its history in this way and to see objects made of materials that connected the world long before our current technologies, cars, telephones, and the internet that's allowing you to watch this right now. We're fortunate to experience cultural diversity through our social networks, through museums, and from our supporting partner communities. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ali Kaba, 
Director of the Washington DC Mayor's Office of African Affairs. Greetings everyone. My name is Ali Kaba and I'm honored to serve as the Director of the Mayor's Office on African Affairs. On behalf of the Mayor's Office on African Affairs, I want to send our congratulations to the exhibition partners and the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art for this wonderful exhibition. One of the most unique aspects of Washington DC is its rich mix of people. I am a proud Mandenka from Guinea Conakry and I love seeing so, so many Africans in the district. While there is such diversity among different groups, common values of courtesy, respect and integrity bring people together. And I'm sure that they will all enjoy seeing this exhibition both online and in person when it's possible. My team and I work to ensure that our DC values are reflected in the work done through the Mayor's Office on African Affairs, the only office at the municipal level in the country dedicated to serving the African community. Our DC values are strong and display through many efforts for our DC African community including our language access program for those with limited or non-English proficiency, the Immigrant Justice Legal Services Grant that ensure legal services to immigrants, and the African Community Grant Program that support the social and economic development of Africans in the district. Truly, Africa's greatness both on the continent and across the world depend on our commitment to unity collaboration and advancement. This is why I want to thank the National Museum of African Art for inspiring conversation about the beauty, power, and the diversity of Africa's arts and culture. We look forward to many future partnerships with you. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you, Ali. Welcome to Excavation Base Camp. From the sorts of fragments assembled here, archaeologists and historians begin the process of reconstructing the past. Join us then in that trip back in time. Materials sifted from archaeological sites around the Sahara Desert are a crucial starting point for understanding the medieval past. These precious fragments connect us to a period that is today almost completely veiled by the passage of time. Remains from three sites are highlighted in the center of this space. Gao, on the arc of the Niger River, Tadmecca, on the southern edge of the Sahara Desert, and Sigil Masa, on the desert's northern edge. They are supplemented by case studies exploring the global trade in objects, glass, ceramics, leather, textiles, found in medieval West Africa. The materials excavated from these sites provide clues to understanding history. However, to fully understand their histories, they must be augmented by additional information drawn from texts, oral accounts, inscriptions, and the careful analysis of a material and cultural legacy that continues into the present day. Together, these diverse pieces of information spark what archaeologists term the archaeological imagination process of seeing the long-hidden past. For example, 
the ruins of Tadmecca in northeast Mali. Medieval Arabic texts describe Tadmecca as a major center on the Trans-Saharan caravan trade. The town was located at the desert's southern fringe, where camel caravans arrived from and departed for the journey across the Sahara. Recent exploration of its ruins has illuminated the town's history and its role in the early Trans-Saharan world. The layout of this central gallery of caravans, the true physical and intellectual heart of the exhibition, is designed to help you make connections between these small, humble fragments assembled in the center and the larger, surviving, complete works assembled on the periphery. These two Chinese works provide a wonderful example a small fragment of Celadon porcelain that was excavated at the site of Tadmecca, Mali, is a type known as Qingbai ware. Produced in southeastern China, Qingbai pottery was widely exported between the 10th and 12th centuries and was exchanged along routes in a process called relay trade. Fragments of Qingbai ware have been found at medieval sites from Central Asia to Egypt and across the Sahara. The shape of this fragment suggests that it once formed part of the rim of a bowl, such as this. You see, then, the archaeological imagination in action, giving proof to the massive reach of Saharan trade. From the Sahara to Asia to Europe, trade then, as now, was a key driver for distributing materials and wares and ideas, and cultural traditions that we still share today. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Mamadou Numaga, Ambassador of the Republic of Mali to the United States. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to share with you a small part of the central role that Mali played in this monumental historical medieval period through Caravan of God. Before, allow me to thank the Smithsonian Museum for the invitation and his dedication to promote art and culture around the world. As you know, Embassy of Mali is engaged to promote cultural diplomacy because it is one we can develop relationship between people. Now, regarding the topic of the exhibition, our country was one of the most important actor medieval trans saharians in West Africa, North Africa, Middle East, in Europe during the medieval period. Fueling this exchange was West African gold, prized for its purity and used for minting currencies and adorning luxurious objects such as jewelry, textile, and religious objects. Transaharian routes began to bypass Audagost. Then Soso, the sovereign chiefdom of the Soninke, gains control of Ghana as well as the Malinke they later eventually liberated by Sunjata Keita, who founded the Mali Empire. The flow of sub-Saharan gold to the northwest probably occurred in the study but small strain. Mansa Musa made his pilgrimage to Mecca. Every place he stopped along the way became so fluid with gold that their economy inflated drastically. After the Mali Empire, the rising Songhai Empire lead on the same results. Gold remained the principal product in the trans-Saharian trade, flowed by cola, nuts, and slaves. The Moroccan scholar Leo Africanus, who visited Songwe in 1510 and 1513s, observed that the governor of Timbuktu owns many articles of gold and that the coins of Timbuktu was made of gold without any stamp and superscription. Through his gold, the king of Mali, Mansa Musa, is considered the richest in the world. Otherwise, the city of Timbuktu culturally played an important role in exchange across medieval. Intellectual activities flourished in Timbuktu and intellectual began to write their own books in a religious or secular term in addition to commentaries or classical work. A hard work a hallmark of the intellectual elite was establishment of personal library, a passion that continues to this day. The personal library of Ahmed Baba, 1556-1627, one of the most famous intellectuals of Timbuktu, contained more than 1,600 volumes. 
Today, it is estimated that there are around 300,000 of these manuscripts in circulation in Tombuctu and neighboring area. Enclosed in this, this page is one of the Africa's greatest intellectual heritage. Fortunately, the keepers of these treasures are deeply committed to the study and sharing of Noele. This manuscript was threatened with disappearing in 2012 following the occupation of the jihadists. Significant efforts have been made to safeguard them through of digitalization. One of the leaders of this safeguard process was Dr. Abdelkader Hydra, who continued to protect and preserve the manuscript through their digitalization uh, with Savannah, his uh, NGOs. So this work deserves the support of our partners. I would like to call upon international community to assist in studying these manuscripts that could reveal important historic and scientific fact. At the time when Mali and the entire Sahel region has been going through a deep and multifaceted crisis, this exhibit is a reminder that this region was one a prosperous one. Thank you so much. In addition to its role as a conduit for goods and people, the Sahara was also connected by ideas. Scholars on both sides of the desert built a common intellectual tradition linked by a shared faith, Islam. This is one of a number of important medieval manuscripts on loan to the exhibition from collecting institutions in Timbuktu, Mali. Born in Ceuta, on the northernmost coast of Morocco, across from Gibraltar, the scholar known as Al-Qadi Iyad wrote a biography of the Prophet Muhammad with devotional instructions in the 12th century of the Common Era. This text is likely a later copy produced in North Africa. It was imported across the Sahara in unknown time and is one of over 40,000 objects in the collection of Mali's Ahmed Baba Institute. Connected to the mighty Niger River, the fabled cities of the Sahara gave rise to a unique and expressive ceramic figural sculptural tradition. The elaborate dress of this equestrian figure suggests ceremonial military attire. It may represent a warrior who was once at the command of Sunjata Keita, founder of the Mali Empire, and one of Emperor Mansa Musa's predecessors. An expression of movement, itself rebuilt from fragments, this piece is an embodiment of the caravan's project. At the center of this space are fabulous examples of golden regalia, proof of the duration and reach of both gold trading and gold making in this region. A tiny 9th or 10th century gold ring from Sigil Massa in Morocco is one of only a few gold objects that have survived from medieval Saharan Africa. A jewel-like 11th century bicarbonate bead is paired with stunning examples of comparable beads from across the centuries and places covered in our story. They gleam with proof of the duration and reach of Saharan aesthetics and ideas. Mansa Musa, the 14th century ruler of the Mali Empire, was immensely wealthy due to the way in which his empire controlled access to West Africa's gold. Indeed, by some measures, he may have been the richest man to have ever lived. His 1324 Hajj to Mecca became legendary for the abundance and virtuosity of goods, like those on display here, it displayed to cities his entourage passed through, like Cairo. The story of the founding of the Mali Empire and the rise of Mansa Musa in the 14th century is fascinating, critically important, and largely unknown to American audiences. I hope this exhibition entices you to explore these stories further. Let's take a moment to hear from curator Kevin Dumouchel about the National Museum of African Arts partnerships for this project. Before the evening concludes, I did want to extend a series of thank yous and shout outs to a number of individuals on behalf of both myself and the National Museum of African Art. Thank you, first of all, to Kathleen Bedford-Burzak for your vision, for your passion, and for your hard work 
that is on view and evident in this project, which I know has been a passion project for nearly a decade. It is my, our pleasure to share that vision with our visitors. Thank you as well to the staff at the Block Museum of Art. You've been consummate professionals and wonderful partners in all of our interactions. We couldn't have pulled this show off without your assistance, particularly in light of this trying year in which you've been wonderfully adaptable and working with our staff, so thank you for that. Thank you as well to the staff of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. We are, as we like to say, a small but mighty staff, and a major project like this really touches upon not only every department, but really every individual staff member who contributes in some fashion to the success of a show like this, from registration, graphic design, editorial, the lighting, the cabinet shop, the, the paint shop, mount making, to AV and tech, education, administration, advancement. You have all contributed in some significant way to the success of the Caravans of Gold project. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you as well to Richard Molinari for your brilliant and beautiful exhibition design that has really allowed this project to shine at its, at its brightest. We are thrilled to be able to share it here tonight and hopefully soon with visitors in our space. Thank you as well to the, our Board of Advisors for your continued support, and to De Deborah Mack in particular for so fearlessly and gamely stepping in to lead us, particularly in a very difficult year. And finally, I want to extend a particular personal and professional thanks to all of the museum partners on the African continent who contributed to the success of this project. It is such an honor and privilege to be able to share your collections, which are cared for and interpreted in African museums on the African continent with our visitors here in Washington. It is, I hope, a real model for the future. And now with that, let us get back to the tour. Once Europeans devised naval technologies for bypassing their former Saharan business partners, power began to shift southward. The establishment of trading posts with Europeans along Africa's Atlantic coast in the late 15th century effectively cut out the series of intermediaries that were essential to Saharan trade. Ships allowed for the transport of greater number of goods than camel caravans. Gold, Ivory and other Saharan trade staples remained important commodities, especially in the early days of coastal trade. However, a new and pernicious industry, the enslavement and export of West African men, women, and children, would come to distort and reshape the region and the Atlantic world. The creation of new trading centers on West Africa's Atlantic coast slowed, but did not wholly end, trans-Saharan trade. New intermediaries, like the Asante Empire in today's central Ghana, benefited from their role as connectors between the Sahara and the Atlantic. In Asante, the legacy of the Saharan gold trade continued. The Asante Hene, or King of Asante, maintained a museum in his palace in Kumasi in which he could display these sorts of exotic curiosities. This ewer might have traveled across Saharan trade routes soon after it was made, or it might have been imported to Asante at a later time through trade along the Atlantic coast. Made in the 14th century, this ewer is embellished with heraldic motifs and Lombardic inscriptions. Images on its lid depicting a stag indicate that it was produced during Richard II's reign in England, specifically between 1390 and 1400. It was taken by the British from Kumasi in 1896 the last in that century's multiple British raids on their Asante rivals. A ritual basin, or kujwo, in turn demonstrates Asante artists' knowledge of forms from as far as Egypt. Historically, Asante royalty wore a dinkra, large wrappers with stamped patterns, only during periods of mourning. The cloths are hand-stamped with a range of visual patterns, each representing a proverb or characteristic. Some Adinkra sign systems may in fact have their origins in the use of Islamic script and talismans by specialists at the king's court. The evocative and surprising remains of a shipwreck close out our tour. In 1992, a wreck was discovered off the coast of Devon in England. The ship sank in the middle of the 17th century, and its cargo included more than 400 gold coins, most of them minted in Morocco as well as North African gold ingots and jewelry. 
Mostly worn and broken, these gold objects were on their way to be melted down and repurposed by the British crown. Today, these rare items provide a glimpse into late medieval North African gold work. The fragment of a clasp is among the earliest surviving examples of a form, the fibula, that has become an iconic symbol of Saharan jewelry. As we round the corner and begin to return temporally to the present day, look for resonances in forms and ideas between these 20th century works and their earlier medieval counterparts. While contemporary to and reflective of their own time, like humble archaeological fragments unearthed from beneath the sands, these pieces also embody centuries of movement of ideas, materials, and peoples. They invite us to remember and to imagine Saharan Africa's central place in world history. Sharing these vital histories through objects is central to our essential mission at the museum. We could not do this work without support from you and other partners. Joining us next is the director of the Block Museum of Art, Lisa Corin. My name is Lisa Corin, and I am the director of Northwestern University's Block Museum of Art. We are the organizer of the exhibition, Caravans of Gold. I wish to thank the National Museum of African Art for agreeing to present the exhibition on the National Mall so that this important scholarship and the magnificent objects on view can be shared with the widest possible public. We are grateful to its Director Emeritus, Dr. Janetta Cole, Director Gus Casely Hayford, Interim Director Deborah Mack, and the museum's Chief Curator, Christine Kramer, for their leadership and early advocacy. And we extend appreciation to the museum's entire staff for their support and can-do spirit while installation of the exhibition was completed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Northwestern University, the Block's home, has had a long-time commitment to African studies. It is also the home of the Melville J. Herskovitz Library, amongst the largest Africana libraries in the world. With this unique strength as its context, the Block is committed to the study and presentation of the art of Africa and the diaspora past and present. For many, Africa's history is largely seen through the writings of European outsiders. This story typically opens with the beginning of European coastal trade at the end of the 15th century, as though before that time, the continent existed outside history or indeed had no history. Caravans of Gold sets out to change this story by looking closely at material remains that predate direct trade with Europe. They are documents of the past that are far too often uncounted for in mainstream history. The role of the museum is to be their interlocutor, to show the relationships between these time travelers and how they can be read like texts to decipher an extraordinary period of time that contradicts what many of us have been taught. They are truly treasures, what remains when so much else has disappeared, and they are what makes the past visible to us. Through the Caravans of Gold exhibition, we are redressing the balance of history and questioning how museums might redefine treasure. As you will see in this exhibition, the medieval period, often called the Dark Ages, was anything but dark in the Saharan region. At the Block, we believe that it is our responsibility to offer to everyone opportunities to question the dominant narratives of history, revealing their underlying structures and the value systems at work. Within each of us is the agency to determine which story we will choose to tell and to believe as a result of an encounter with the object and ideas on display in our galleries. We ask visitors to this exhibition to join us in this process of critical reflection, penetrating the layers of historic narratives, sifting through the sands of time to discover what lays buried beneath our assumptions. Reflecting upon these fragments in time is a profound form of activism and an opportunity to be a change agent. Scholars and cultural institutions in Mali, Morocco, and Nigeria have been essential partners in making Caravans of Gold possible. We thank them for sharing their knowledge and their cultural patrimony with the audiences of three North American museums. The exhibition would have been impossible without our partnerships with these institutions. 
In Mali, the Direction Nationale de Patrimoine Cultural, Institut des Hautes Etudes et des Recherches Islamiques Ahmad Baba, the Institut des Sciences Humaines and the Musée National du Mali. In Morocco, the Fondation Nationale des Musées, Ministère de la Culture et de la Communication, Royaume du Maroc, and the Musée Banque El Maghrib. And in Nigeria, the National Commission for Museums and Monuments. Kathleen Bickford Burzog, the exhibition curator, who is the Bloc's Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs, insisted that every aspect of this exhibition observe the highest ethical standards. This commitment has been the foundation of the relationships she built over a decade with these partners. She has amplified the voices of scholars, archaeologists, and curators from Mali, Morocco, and Nigeria, ensuring they had a shaping impact on the Caravans of Gold story. Kathleen is a visionary curator, a visionary scholar, and an equally innovative storyteller. The legacy of her exhibition will live on in a landmark book which she has edited and we have, which we have co-published with Princeton University Press. The Block is privileged to be part of Northwestern University, one of the world's great research institutions, and we thank its president, Morton O. Shapiro, and his senior staff for their unwavering support of the Block in this project. I wish to close by thanking the entire Block team, each of whom has been committed to the profound opportunity offered by this timely exhibition. The Caravans of Gold story is a reminder to our fellow Americans that Africa's history is our history, and our history is Africa's history. At this moment of national racial reckoning, we hope that a better understanding of this shared history will enable us to create a more equitable future. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you again for your collegial leadership, your patience and your flexibility in working with us in developing this exhibition under these challenging circumstances. Before we conclude tonight's exhibition celebration, please join me in welcoming Chair of the Advisory Board of the National Museum of African Art, Magdalene Johnson Obaji. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen around the world. On behalf of the Advisory Board of the National Museum of African Art, I welcome you to our virtual opening of Caravans of Gold. Thank you for joining us this evening. The National Museum of African Art is one of the Smithsonian's greatest treasures. Our mission is to inspire conversations about the beauty the power and diversity of Africa's arts and cultures worldwide. I know we've accomplished this with you tonight. Wherever you might be watching this program from, I hope that you and your families are well and safe. And I hope that one day soon, we will be able to welcome you to our museum in Washington, DC. Until then, Please explore the online exhibition of Caravans of Gold on our website. That website is africa.si.edu. Once again, africa.si.edu. And I ask that you consider making a contribution to support this extraordinary museum with which will enable us to offer great education programs, paid internships, as well as captivating exhibitions. This exceptional museum shares vital African stories from antiquity to contemporary for audiences around the world. And we simply could not fulfill our mission without you. Many thanks for all of your support, and we look forward to welcoming you to the National Museum of African Art, the gem on the mall. Congratulations to Deborah and her team for a job well done, putting on this wonderful exhibition. Once again, welcome and thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you, Maggie. 
And at this time, I want to also thank all the members of our advisory board for their strong support. Most importantly, thank you to all of you for watching this special presentation. For those that make a contribution to support the museum this evening, you will receive a special print of our equestrian figure, the signature image of this exhibition, as a thank you. We are grateful for all of your support in all of its forms, and we look forward to welcoming you to see Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, in person one day soon.